So, Ani Buju, uh, hmm, Minogajep, uh, Zozep, and Dishnikaz, Waganak Singo Dao and Dao, G Jack and Dodum. Uh, my name is Joe Van Alstein. I'm from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Dao Indians, and I'm Crane Clan. And I'm proud to be here today to talk about, uh, you know, food access. Uh, with the 638 program that we're doing here at the Little Traverse Bay Bands with Dow Indians. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I am the past national president of the association. The association was created in 1996 to, uh, you know, better the FDPIR program, the Kamad program. And so I want to give thanks to those elders who have been on the front lines uh, fighting for food and nutrition through this program since then and before. Um, without their leadership, I wouldn't be standing here today to talk about what we're doing. So uh, I would just want to say miigwech. I know there's some here in this room as well, so I just want to say miigwech to you as well. So, um, But with that, you know, they created NAF Dipper. And NAF Dipper, uh, you know, really wants to improve the lives of our, of our citizens, of our, um, our participants. And so with that, you know, we've always been struggling to put better foods into this food distribution program. You know, we created a food, um, uh, what's that, the food package review work group. <laughs> and with that, you know, we sit down uh, and we have four members from each region who sit on this food package review work group with the USDA. And we want to make sure that we have tribal representation so we can let them know exactly what we want in this food package. And so after all of these meetings and all of these meetings, we didn't get anywhere. <laughs> so finally, what we had to do was uh, we started a tribal leaders consultation work group where we would bring our tribal leaders uh, to the table and they would talk for us because consultation back in the day meant just a phone call to me, just the food distribution director, and that was it. And it would just go anywhere. So we said, hey, let's get this group together and bring our tribal leaders to the table. And so with the tribal leaders coming to the table, you know, they really um, started listening to us and um, really started listening to us. And, and that was great. So I just want to thank the tribal leaders who come to the table today and also speak on our behalf as well. So, um, but with this tribal leaders consultation work group and the food package Food, food package review work group, uh, we really sat down and we talked about these foods. And bison was the very first food that was put into the food package. And I want to say that was like 1998. I, I want to say there was some like some bison put in there. Uh, but we kept talking about this food. And uh, each region sat down and we said, you know, the, the Mountain Plains region wanted bison, the Midwest region wanted um, Minoman, the Southwest region wanted uh, blue cornmeal, and the Western region wanted salmon. So we started talking about how do we get this food into the food package? You know, is there producers out there? We wanted to be able to, uh, you know, support our tribal economies and support our tribal producers as well. Because when we talk about traditional food, it's food that feeds our spirit as well. You know, so I'm from the Midwest region, and when I talk about Minoman, like even right now, I'm just like getting all a little goose pimply about it because it just feeds my spirit and knows that I'm talking about it right now. And so, <laughs> but we wanted to make sure it was hand harvested wild rice. We wanted, it had to be, you know, parched over a wood fire. And you know, who, who does that? Who makes wild rice to the amount that the USDA wanted it? And we have to remember the USDA is an equal opportunity employer and provider. So they want everybody to get the same thing, right? But we said, we're not all the same. There's 576 different tribes throughout um, the nation. And there's 103 tribes that actually participate in FDPIR. So we all have different wants and needs when it comes to nutrition. But wild rice was the one that the Midwest region really wanted. And it was really tough for the USDA to be like, oh, what? We, we, we don't know what you know wild rice is. And so we had to you know, show them what wild rice was. Um, and it's not your Uncle Ben's wild rice. We know that for sure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so with that, we, um, you know, we, we looked at you know wild rice. Uh, we we found some producers uh, who could produce to the quantities that um, the USDA wanted. Because on average, uh, we did what 96,000 people per month. I want to say get served um, food distribution program. It ranges from 80 to 100 100,000 people a month. And if it's an equal opportunity employer, that's a you know, that's one pound of wild rice per person per month, you know, so that's 90,000 pounds of wild rice. That's a lot. And we realized that we can't feed the whole entire country that way. And so the Midwest region is like, why, why can't we just make it our own? 
And so after all these discussions, we looked at it and said, what about 638, right? Why, why can't we like buy our own food and put it in our own program? And uh, so that really started the conversation back in like 20, 2013 of like, how, how do we do that? And we brought it to our tribal leaders, our tribal leaders, you know, brought it to the farm bill and you know, now it's in the farm bill and we're gonna continue with it. So I, again, I wanna thank you to the tribal leaders for that 638 push. So, um, so you know, w with that, you know, we, we looked at other foods, right? What are the other foods that we want in there? And so we worked with the food package review work group. You know, we created list after list. Um, I, I think the biggest one now is we have, uh, we have walleye in the food package now. That was another one. Uh, we looked for lamb and we couldn't find lamb, uh, but that was you know an actual option uh, to have in the food package. Um, yeah, the walleye one. I'm not going to go on that one, but that was they couldn't find any producers of walleye, <laughs> and I was like, what? I, I mean, really? <laughs> they came back after a year with like a paragraph and said, we can't find any. And I just opened up Google and I was like, oh, look, Red Lake. <laughs> so, but uh, so we, you know, we got to help them with that. And they're willing to learn. So I appreciate that. Um, but so enough about, you know, that, that food package review work group. So how it looked to me is like for my program, you know, I serve about 200 people a month and I get my delivery truck on a Thursday and my fresh produce comes in on a Thursday and again I'm a government program so I'm not I'm closed on the weekends you know I'm off taking my time or I'm off traveling but we get our produce on Thursday I'm like that doesn't work for me I need that produce on Monday or Tuesday because I want it to be able to get out to my clients I want them to be able to have it in their refrigerator all week because what happens like like take for instance this week Monday is a holiday my produce truck comes in on Tuesday or Thursday the people have to come in on Friday to get their produce. And what if they can't make it in on Friday? That produce sits in our cooler, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday they're able to get it. And I said, you know, that just doesn't work. Uh, you know, I want to be able to contract with who I want to contract. I want to work with somebody who can give me what I want when I want it. And I want fresh produce on Monday or Tuesday, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and working with our producer, you know, they were like, well, we can't give it to you Monday or Tuesday. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go find somebody who can give, go give it to me Monday and Tuesday. And so um, you know, with that, uh, that was my real drive for pushing for this because I wanted to make sure my, my clients and my citizens had that ability to have fresh produce. But then, lo and behold, my tribe looked at it and said, you know what, Joe, we need to buy a farm. And so <laughs> back in 2014, they bought a 300 acre farm called ZB Mijuang. And I have a logo uh, right here with it. And it means uh, the place where food grows near the river. And it's a Beautiful farm. It's 300 acres, 200 of it's wooded. We have 100 tillable um, acres to, to till. And so they're like, we bought it, now what? <laughs> it's like my friend Gary Besaw says, we caught the car, but now what? <laughs> I was like, oh. So, uh, so, we, so we bought, we, we, we purchased a farm. Um, and here uh, in 2020, we won farm of the year for the state of Michigan uh, for the work that we did in there. Uh, it's been a long road, but you know, trying to find and bring that food access back to our people as well was also connecting it. And I think food distribution directors throughout the country are more than just people who hand out food. We're people who are out there who need to be at these conferences every day and working to bring better food to our programs. Uh, not saying carrots are bad or fresh fruit. I mean, that can beef is still bad. I'm just letting you know. So, uh, <laughs> but the cheese, the cheese is good. So, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, we, we, we won farmer of the year in 2020. It was such a big honor, you know, and, uh, we, we grew everything from arugula to zucchini. You know, we were working on bringing our own traditional foods back. Cause that's the other thing we wanted is other than just, you know, walleye and wild rice, you know, we wanted corn. Uh, we wanted different types of squash that we wanted in our food package that was traditional to us. And so, uh, with this here is one of our constitutional directives from the tribe. And the third one is that, uh, we need to raise the level of nutrition and the standard of living for our people. And that, I mean, that's number three on our director principles for our, our tribal constitution. And so that is one of the things that led the tribe to buy the farm. Um, and then to do the things and allow me to do what I want to do by providing our, 
um, our people with traditional foods and good healthy foods. So uh, this is just a little bit about what our farm is supposed to do. We provide food sovereignty uh, within LTBB uh, to improve the health. We provide education opportunities. With that, you know, we show uh, our tribal citizens, you know, how to hunt deer. Uh, because, you know, those deer like to come out and, you know, eat, eat the plants and eat the leafy greens. So we have to, you know, control them in a, in a good way. So we taught them out how to go hunt. And then we taught them how to process the deer. And then we taught them how to take the, the hide and turn it into a drum. Uh, you know, these are the types of things that we do out there, you know. Uh, to, we taught them how to, we went out into the woods and we cut down, you know, an ash tree and we showed them how to make lacrosse sticks. And all this is all integrated into food and making um, our people more aware of what's going on within their bodies and their health as well. So, um, and this is just a picture of, of our 300 acre farm and you can see down in the little potion stamp down in the corner, that's the only part that we till down there and we're working on no-till gardening as well uh, to help, you know, reintroduce uh, microbiomes and make that land better as well. So. Um, so yeah, uh, when I hired my farm manager, uh, back in 2019, uh, he's from Ghana <laughs> and he spent 14 years working at, uh, one of the other successful farms in our, in our country, but he has a great love for the land and growing and teaching and the people that he like are, we just gravitate to him because he's always smiling. He's always happy, but he's so full of knowledge and and he always shares with me how they do things in Ghana and how similar it is to how we do things here as a tribe. You know, because we were talking about corn and how do we pound corn using a butagen. And he's like, oh, let me show you our butagen, <laughs> right? And, and, and it, he just really connects with us and our tribal citizens who come out there and work. We have about 14 tribal citizens who work on the farm uh, throughout the year, uh, mainly during the summer. But during the wintertime, we have, we just carry four employees during the wintertime. But... And so that brings 14 people to work. Uh, we also have a store called Minogan. It's up here in the tip of the mitt as well. That's our farm store where we sell the produce. Um, but when my farm manager walked into my food distribution program, he said, Joe, he's like, you got a lot of nice produce in here, but why isn't our produce in here? <laughs> and I said, good question, KK. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to get that in here. You know, that, that's the work that I do on the national level. And he's like, well, I would really like to see, you know, our produce in here. And so with that, I said, we will get it done. And so, uh, you know, continue working, working, working with 638. We finally have fresh produce. Oh, that's not fresh produce. <laughs> that's a picture of our trade routes and our reservation. <laughs> so, but we finally have fresh produce in, in our program. Uh, today, as we're speaking, uh, my accounting department is working with Red Lake Fisheries to produce or to have walleye put into our program. We are going to actually work with our farm to put carrots, lettuce, squash, um, corn, and then um, spinach. And what's the, there's one more in there, radishes. They're going to be putting those into, into the food package. Again, because like I live in the tip of northern Michigan, our growing season isn't that long. So we do have four, you know, 30 by 100 foot greenhouses that we can grow in uh, to extend the season as well. Um, so, yeah, that, that's busy with uh, ZB Mijuang and Minogan. Uh, and so here is one of the things that I, I think is cool. Um, and about traditional foods and what we do. And it kind of also talks about some of the things I've heard t today uh, working with uh, the, the university. So here's a picture of Andrew Edwigizic. He sits on our board, um, but his, his, uh, his uncle is uh, Frank Edwigizic. I don't know, some of you guys might have heard that guy before. He's, he's been around. So, But his mom was an anthropologist, and she moved to you know northern Michigan back in the 30s. And so she would take um, recordings and, you know, she would bring some stuff back to the University of Michigan. Well, she brought um, these, these corn right here. So these are the last ears of corn that was grown on our, on our land um, since the 1930s. Uh, these are the last remaining corn. And so uh, with that, you know, we worked at the University of Michigan to rematriate these seeds 
um, back into the ground and into our community. Uh, so next Wednesday, Andrew and myself uh, and some more community members will be traveling to the University of Michigan to take these seeds out of captivity, because that's where they're in right now. <laughs> right? And we're going to take them back home and we're going to grow these seeds out. And here we have a, a white flint corn and a black popcorn. And we're excited to, you know, rematriate these seeds with their land. And, you know, and put these seeds and this food back into the body of our, of our citizens. Because again, what's happened is our citizens have also lost the taste of this traditional food. So we have to slowly incorporate it back into the program. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to share this slide because I just think it's truly important that we bring this food back. So with that, uh, any questions? <laughs> Or am I early? You're good. Let's hmm. take some questions on pigeonhole. So go on your device and put those questions in. Thank you so much. And I was uh, drooling too over Monoman. <laughs> it's good. And I just want to say thank you to the planning committee too. You guys are amazing and you guys did a great job on this. Aww, so thank you. I know it's a lot of her hard work planning a conference. So it's and good. this is like a couple, <laughs> a couple years in. Right? Yeah, because yes. of the pandemic, we're like, maybe next year we'll be in person. Then next year, and now here we are. That's so <laughs> I'm glad to see um, so many people. So Thank you so much. Um, so we have some questions here. Okay. How do you have the youth participate in your farms? Oh, that's a very great question. How do we get the youth to participate uh, in our farm? Uh, so we, our, our natural resource department has a youth conservation corps, and with that, you know, they take these youth throughout the summer, and uh, they take them to different departments and programs and teach them little things. So they they'll spend like two days working on the farm. They'll spend two days working out in the field with the biologists, or you know, out in the rivers with the biologists. And so that has actually, we probably have four employees right now who came from that program because they enjoyed um, working on the farm. Uh, so that is how we really, you know, engage the youth to come out there and work during the summertime. Uh, but we also have a spring, uh, a spring planting ceremony where we bring the whole community out and we bring the youth out there and we, you know, teach them and show them what we're doing as well. And then we have a harvest feast um, where we, you know, braid corn and, you know, teach them how to process the, the stuff as well. Uh, the drum workshop was an amazing workshop to bring them out there. Uh, I wish I had pictures of that one, but... Uh, they were really excited to make a drum out of actual um, uh, deer hide. So that's how we get the youth involved. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And making a game of lacrosse, too, because that's fun. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you so much. Um, let's look at another question. Can you share how this distribution program supports protecting ecological rights, especially around Minoman? Uh, yeah, another great question because, you know, we know that Wisconsin, uh, you know, just – um, fought for the rights of Minoman. And in our community, Minoman isn't as prevalent as it is here in Wisconsin or Minnesota because of all the lakes around where we live have been, um, you know, big houses have been put up and people just, you know, use all these different types of pesticides to kill the wild rice because they don't want to look at it, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't look good on their pictures from that stuff. So, um, um, so with that, uh, Oh man, <laughs> we are slowly working on bringing wild rice back. Um, and with that, we wanna make sure that we don't over harvest wild rice. And I think with the 638 program, you know, that the, it offers the tribes the ability to purchase what they want and what they need, right? Because if, you know, these tribes in the Southwest don't, they don't know what wild rice is, right? I'm from the Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> I, not to say that you can't eat wild rice, right? Because it's good. <laughs> But for us, again, it's a very spiritual food for us when we yeah. talk about wild rice because I know it's the same food my grandmother ate and my great-grandmother. I know that walleye is the same walleye that they tasted. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's a very spiritual connection. And I think that you from the Southwest would have that connection with your food mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. right? So, but for here, for here, I think 638 is important because it allows us to purchase what we want and need to support our tribal citizens. Mm -hmm. So, oh, whew, that was a good yeah. question. <laughs> And I love making um, Shiloh maple, where is our sister. Anyway, she makes the wild rice. Where is Shiloh with some, at? 
syrup, but Ani, we have the, the maple, but uh, we have the choke cherry syrup mm -hmm. that we use and with some strawberries and some nuts. Um, but I've learned that from our sister there. So thank you. Next question. Can you talk about what kind of support at a tribal leadership level is needed to do this? All of the support. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think even from our own standpoint, from my own tribe standpoint, we don't think about ag. We, we didn't think about ag in that way. Um, and so for us to, you know, I'm working personally to create a tribal department of agriculture because when we go talk to the USDA, you know, we want to be able, on the same level with them, you know, um, and work as a partnership together. So by creating, you know, food sovereignty uh, departments, uh, ag departments, uh, that really, you know, forces our ability to be sovereign as well. And so with that, I think uh, having our tribal leaders at these work groups, at these farm bill meetings, uh, is important. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much. Everyone, strong applause for him. Miigwech. Miigwech.